today's lesson we're going to look at enzymes. The first aim is describe the lock and key mechanism, then explain how different factors affect enzyme activity, and finally explain how to practically measure the rate of enzyme activity. Enzymes are another topic that get bad press in biology. To many students, enzymes are things that break down food and that's about it. Whereas the reality is enzymes work behind the scenes, keeping you alive for many reasons. Now enzymes aren't living, but they are found in all living systems. And I like to think of them as micro-machines, like tiny nanobots that circulate around your body, fixing things, breaking things apart, building things up. Enzymes assist vital chemical reactions such as respiration. They're involved in the process of DNA replication and protein synthesis. Essentially, enzymes work like tiny clamps holding molecules in place while they can be broken apart or stitched together. You may have heard this term before, but enzymes are referred to as biological catalysts. What that means is biological in that they are found in living things, and catalyst means they increase the speed of a chemical reaction without being changed or used up in the reaction so they can be reused. That's the point. Enzymes don't actually make chemical reactions happen, they just speed them up. But when I say speed up, I really do mean speed up. They speed up chemical reactions by about 100 billion times the rate at which they normally occur. To give you a bit of a context, let's say an average human life is 75 years. And let's say that 75 year lifespan represented the length of a chemical reaction. If an enzyme was involved in catalyzing your life, your lifespan would be reduced to something around a fifth of a second. What this means is, is that without enzymes, chemical reactions would occur so slowly in our body that we would not be able to survive. So they speed up reactions to a rate at which makes life possible. Now you may have done this reaction in a lab yourself, but if you get hydrogen peroxide, this is a toxic waste substance made by many cellular reactions within the body. It must be broken down to stop us getting poisoned. And if you react that with yeast, more specifically, the enzyme within yeast, catalase, catalase is also found in your liver, you will produce water and oxygen. So here we have hydrogen peroxide under the influence of catalase producing water and oxygen. And you can see that reaction here. So I've got hydrogen peroxide and catalase in here. As the reaction produces oxygen, it gets trapped and forms this foam which erupts out the top. We use the lock and key hypothesis or the lock and key model to explain how enzymes work. It assumes that an enzyme, which is basically a three-dimensional protein, has a special region called an active site. Now that active site has a very specific shape that is complementary to a specific target molecule we call a substrate. Now the word complementary means fitting like two pieces of a jigsaw. So what will happen is the enzyme will bond with the substrate temporarily. The enzyme will then hold the substrate in place, putting it under a little bit of pressure, which makes it easier for other molecules such as water to collide with the enzyme and break it apart to form the products. You see the force of a water molecule striking a target molecule would not be enough to break it apart very easily. So by enzymes putting the target molecule or the substrate under pressure, it lowers the amount of energy needed to break them apart. But for your exams, just remember this is how enzymes work. The substrate bonds with the active site of an enzyme and is catalyzed. That means the reaction it's involved in is sped up to form the products. One of the most important factors about an enzyme is that it is specific. We have many, many different types of enzymes in our body and they all act upon specific substrates, specific target molecules. This gives a body control over the chemical reactions that occur within it. Also, by having enzymes, we don't need as much energy to get these chemical reactions going, so we don't need to have our body at ridiculously high temperatures. So you can see here, amylase is an enzyme that is complementary to the substrate starch. Catalase is an enzyme that's complementary to the substrate hydrogen peroxide. Lactase is an enzyme which is complementary to the substrate lactose. And trypsin is an enzyme that is complementary to the substrate protein. People, for example, who are lactose intolerant cannot produce lactase, so they cannot break down milk sugars. As a result, these sugars stay in the gut because they're too large to be absorbed into our bloodstream. Bacteria feed on them and produce gases, which causes bloating. The sugars draw out water by osmosis from the bloodstream. So now we have water in our gut as well, and that causes diarrhea, all because of one enzyme not working properly. Notice one other thing here. Most enzymes end with the letters A, S, E. 
amylase, catalase, lactase. I put in this as an example of one which doesn't. Trypsin is a protein digesting enzyme which doesn't end with ASC. Pepsin is another one. But if you see a word which ends with A's, it's going to be an enzyme. So it's quite common in exams that you're required to explain the lock and key model. It will usually be about three marks. They can sometimes ask you to draw a diagram as well. You could draw something like these. But here's what you write. Enzymes have an active site that is complementary in shape to a specific substrate. The capitalized words represent different marking points. So three marks in total. So hopefully you can understand why it's called the lock and key model because the enzyme is like a lock and the substrate is like a key which fits inside it. Because locks are specific to one key, just like enzymes, we call it the lock and key hypothesis. So that is how you describe the lock and key mechanism. Now we're going to look at the factors that affect enzyme activity. You see, enzymes are very, very sensitive to the specific conditions within our bodies. Three factors that affect enzyme activity are temperature, pH, and substrate concentration, although you could also say enzyme concentration. You will need to be able to describe and explain different types of enzyme rate of reaction graphs. Learn them by their specific shapes. The temperature graph is quite easy to remember. You start at zero, going up gradually, then you peak, and then the drop is more rapid. So this graph represents a series of enzyme reactions carried out at different temperatures, not just one reaction occurring over a range of temperatures. The light pink sentences here are descriptions, and the red ones are explanations. An explanation is when we give a scientific reason for something we observe, and what we observe is the description. So we're going to start at this point over here. As temperature increases, so does the rate of reaction. Now the explanation. Because the enzymes and substrates have more kinetic energy, which increases the frequency of successful collisions. So at low temperatures, enzymes and substrates move slowly. And at high temperatures, they move quicker. That increases the chances of them colliding successfully. Just like as in a dodgem car rink at a fairground. Imagine lots of dodgem cars were moving randomly and then you could speed them up. They would hit each other more frequently. But the other important language to use is I've not just said collision, but successful collision. You see, this would be a collision, that would be a collision, but that's a successful collision. So a successful collision is when the active site bonds with the substrate. So that explains this part of the graph. Now we're over here. You'll notice this is at 37 degrees Celsius, our human body temperature. So for this enzyme, 37 degrees Celsius is the optimum temperature. That means where the frequency of successful collisions is greatest. In other words, where the enzyme works best. Be aware that 37 degrees Celsius is the optimum temperature for human enzymes. But if you were an Arctic ice fish, then it would make sense that the optimum temperature for their enzymes is much lower. Now we're going to explain this part. You see, if an enzyme is placed under conditions that do not suit it, such as the incorrect pH or too high a temperature, notice how I didn't say too low, only too high, then the bonds that hold the enzyme structure in place start to vibrate and eventually break. This causes the enzyme's shape to change. And as a consequence, so does the shape of the active site. The point is, this enzyme can no longer bond with the substrate. You can describe all that using one word. The enzyme has denatured. Denaturing literally means the shape of the enzyme is changed so it can no longer do its job. Some poisons, such as cyanide, will change the shape of an enzyme. So at temperatures just past optimum, the enzyme starts to denature, and the higher the temperature goes, the more enzymes denature. This puts an end to the reaction pretty swiftly. So, after optimum temperature, the rate of reaction falls rapidly as enzymes start to denature. Denature is such an important word in enzymes that I'd almost say, when in doubt, just write denature in an enzyme-based question for an easy mark. So, just to review, as temperature increases, so does the rate of reaction, because enzymes and substrates have more kinetic energy, which increases the frequency of successful collisions. At 37 degrees Celsius, we have reached optimum temperature. This is where the rate of reaction is at its fastest. Beyond optimum temperature, the enzyme starts to denature and the rate of reaction falls rapidly. The Himalayan rabbit gives us a great example of how enzymes can be affected by temperature. As you might expect, this mountain-dwelling rabbit lives in fairly cold temperatures. But its body temperature varies on the peripherals. In fact, where the ears are, the tips of the nose and the feet, it's colder. 
you'll notice that it's black where it's colder. This is because an enzyme which likes colder conditions is active here and it produces the pigment melanin which makes things look dark. Where its body is warmer, the enzyme is inactive, so melanin cannot be made. So what you can do is if you place an ice cube onto the white part of the body and leave it there for a bit, the cooler conditions will activate the enzyme and melanin will be produced. So when you lift off the ice cube, you have black fur. Pretty amazing. Enzyme pH graphs generally look like this. You are often given an example which shows the activity of two enzymes, not just one. Here we have the enzyme pepsin and the enzyme amylase. You can see the pH scale across the bottom, whereas red is very acidic and purple is alkali and green is neutral. You can see pepsin has an optimum pH of 2, whereas amylase has an optimum pH of 7. So it's no surprise that you'd find pepsin, the protein digesting enzyme, in our stomach because it lives within stomach acid. And amylase you can find in neutral conditions such as in our mouths, in our saliva and in our small intestine. If you deviate away from optimum conditions, then once again the enzyme can no longer bond with the substrate because it starts to denature. So to explain this graph, you'd say pepsin has an optimum pH of 2, amylase has an optimum pH of 7. Any change around these optimum values causes the rate of reaction to fall steeply as the enzyme denatures. Notice how the pH curves have a steeper fall and rise than the temperature curve. This tells us that enzymes are a little bit more fussy about pH levels than they are about temperature. Finally, let's look at substrate concentration, and this introduces the idea of limiting factors. So substrate concentration is just our way of saying how much substrate we allow our enzymes to react with. By increasing it, we're just adding more substrate into the mix. So you can see here that as we increase substrate concentration, the rate of reaction increases. And that makes sense because currently this enzyme can bond with this substrate, but you have all these enzymes with nothing to do. Whereas if we add more substrate into the reaction, then those enzymes can now go to work and start to catalyze the reaction. This means product will be formed at a faster rate. So as substrate concentration increases, so does the rate of reaction. This is because it increases the frequency of successful collisions, that term again. Now I'm gonna introduce a new term. Here, the substrate concentration is the limiting factor. So over this portion of the graph, where I've written A, substrate concentration is the limiting factor. It can limit the reaction. So if I was to make this the maximum level of substrate I put into the reaction, this is where the rate of reaction would level off. But you'll notice what happens that as we continue to increase the substrate concentration, it's having no effect on the rate of reaction. The rate of reaction is not getting any faster. So beyond this point, something else becomes the limiting factor. The most obvious reason for this would be the lack of enzymes. You see now all the active sites are occupied. So if we add more substrate into the reaction, not much can happen because all active sites are being used. So the enzymes cannot help in the breakdown of these substrates. So after a concentration of 20 moles per decimeter cubed, the rate of reaction levels off. Notice how I've quoted figures here. It's good to always quote figures on your graph where relevant. And this is because all active sites are occupied. So something else is now the limiting factor. Even though I've said enzyme concentration is the limiting factor, you'd still get marks if you said any other factor that affects enzyme activity, such as temperature and pH. And that is how you explain how different factors affect enzyme activity. Now let's look at how we measure the rate of an enzyme-controlled reaction. I'm going to give you the base experiment here for which you can adapt to test out different factors such as pH and temperature and substrate concentration as I've just shown you. For this, in addition to safety goggles, because iodine is harmful, you will need a spotting tile. That's the small white plastic dishes you get with wells in them. You will need iodine solution and a pipette. You will need starch and amylase solution, very freshly made. You can't leave this to stand for long because otherwise the amylase will break down all the starch. And you'll need a stop clock. The first thing you do is add a drop of iodine to each well of a spotting tile, like so, etc, etc. Then you start the timer. Every five seconds add a drop of starch amylase solution to each well. So let's say the first five seconds have passed and I've dropped some starch amylase solution onto the first well. 
When starch reacts with iodine, it turns a blue-blackish colour. Remember that amylase helps break down starch, so at the moment it hasn't broken down the starch, which is why we can still detect it using iodine. So after the first 5 seconds, the iodine did change to a bluish-blackish colour. Now 10 seconds have passed, an additional 5 seconds. And once again, we have the colour change. So it changed again. So we continue, every 5 seconds we're doing this. And once again we see the colour change. So now 20 seconds have passed, but this time we get no colour change. So the iodine at 20 seconds did not change colour. So what this tells us is that somewhere between 15 and 20 seconds all the starch was broken down in our solution. And that's why iodine couldn't detect it and change colour. So we can now repeat this experiment using different temperatures of starch amylase solution or we could use different pH buffer solutions, or we could vary the concentration of starch, and we can compare our results against our baseline results. Whichever factor you are varying, make sure you control all other factors. So if you're changing temperature, make sure the pH and substrate concentration and enzyme concentration are the same. Also, to increase the accuracy of this test, you may want to reduce the time intervals. This will give you a better idea of when the change actually happened. Because here, we only know that it happened between 15 and 20 seconds. But we do not know the exact point. And that is how we explain how to practically measure the rate of enzyme activity.